Hello and welcome to the Transatlantic Slavery Symposium. I'm Dr. Miranda Kaufman, author of Black Tudors, The Untold Story, which is a book about Africans in 16th century England. Uh, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in London. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this symposium, which is, uh, there's events happening all week, but, um, and it's a joint effort between the Robert H. Smith Scholarship Centre at the Benjamin Franklin House of London, uh, the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon, and the Robert H. Smith International Centre for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. Um, with, there's going to be six sessions this week being broadcast across all of those people's f YouTube, Facebook and Twitter channels and they will be available to replay immediately after each programme ends. And we're excited that you can get involved today by posting questions in the comments section on all of those social media channels and we will do our best to answer some of those questions uh, towards the end of, of today's discussion. Um, and uh, I'm really delighted to be here with three such titans in the field to talk about transatlantic slavery, uh, transatlantic abolition and the law. Um, we have, um, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves really because uh, I want to hear more of their voices than mine today. Um, so I, I'm going to start with, uh, can we uh, say hello to Professor John Cairn speaking to us from Edinburgh? John, if you say a few words to introduce yourself. Hi. Well, thanks, Miranda. I'm John Kearns. I'm Professor of Civil Law at the University of Edinburgh. I'm essentially um, a legal historian. He Hello, John. Hi. All okay? I, I can't hear you. Can you hear? Okay. Can other people hear? I can you? hear you. Oh, no. I'm not muted. I shall carry on on the assumption um, that people can hear me. Now, I'm a professor of civil law at the University of Edinburgh. I'm a legal historian specialised in the 18th century. And one of the things I've been very interested in is um, uh, individuals, primarily of African, but also of Indian and indeed Native American descent, now in in Scotland. Now, in my short introduction, I'll just start across the Atlantic in Virginia. On 3 November 1775, the Virginia Gazette contained an advertisement inserted by one John Aylett, and it's for a runaway enslaved young man named Harry. Of course, such advertisements are common in the colonies and they're common in the British Isles for that matter. And uh, Aylett, who inserted the advertisement, was from a prominent family in King William County, in the Tidewater area of Virginia, and he had earlier in the same year advertised for a runaway cook uh, called Rachel, runaway enslaved cook called Rachel. Harry, however, had been recently sold to Aylett by someone called John, James Donald. And he was described as speaking Scotch and also as singing Scotch songs. That's actually quite interesting. The songs are quite interesting thing in themselves. So young Harry had evidently been brought up in Scotland. And his former holder, James Donald, is almost certainly a member of a prominent uh, and rather large family of Scottish merchants and minor landowners who are much involved with uh, Jamaica, Virginia, and indeed a, a younger cousin of uh, the person who'd sold um, Harry, uh, uh, was a friend and correspondent of Thomas Jefferson. But Harry probably ended up in Virginia uh, because of two court cases. One was in England, the case of Somerset against Stuart, a well-known case. And it's, uh, it's an English case, of course. And um, although Stuart was a Scotsman, in fact, he's uh, buried not very far from where I'm speaking to you. And indeed, Stuart was an alumnus of Edinburgh University. And the second is the case of Knight against Wedderburn, finally decided in February 1778. As I said, the first is very well known, the second not so. Now, the first is popular, was, was, was and still is popularly seen as having freed the slaves in England. Um, this, uh, there's some question about this, this is, if this is what really happened, uh, but uh, may, may be discussed later. 
or perhaps perhaps the judge just decided the, that Somerset couldn't be sent forcibly across the Atlantic against his will to be sold. The Scottish case, however, decided that James Knight was free just by virtue of being in Scotland. It decided, the Scottish court basically decided that Scotland was a free soil, as would later be described in the United States. Now, what has happened, I think, with Harry is he's been between Somerset's case, perhaps freeing the slaves in England, and Knight's case, which deftly freed the slaves in Scotland or those enslaved in Scotland, he's been sent across to be sold by Donald. And I can find other examples of this. So Harry ends up in Virginia, although he's clearly been brought up in Scotland, uh, because uh, his master, his slave, the slave owner, didn't wish to lose the value. And as I said, there are other examples. So I think this is an interesting example. It introduces the transatlantic in issue. It introduces the legal issue. And it introduces the tremendous impact it had on people's lives. And the, this unfortunate young man suddenly transported across the Atlantic, sold to a stranger, and there he runs away, understandably. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, but there was a few technical difficulties there, so I didn't hear all that. So if I ask you any stupid questions later, that is why. Uh, next, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Vincent Brown uh, to, to introduce himself. I'm excited that we're discussing transatlantic history in a truly transatlantic way today. Hi, yes, yes. Hello. Uh, can you all hear me? Miranda, can you hear me? I can, I can hear you. I'm delighted. <laughs> yeah, I'm joining you from San Diego, California, and I, I'm, I'm a, it's a real pleasure to be with you all. And uh, thank you all uh, who have been able to join us uh, wherever you happen to be. Um, in my brief time, so I'm a professor of history and African African American studies at Harvard University. Uh, I've just completed a book uh, called Tacky's Revolt, the story of an Atlantic slave war in which one of the questions I think is something that concerns all three of the people on the panel. Um, and it's, it's a general question in, in what I think is becoming an increasingly fruitless debate, um, which is that question of who deserves credit for abolition. Uh, is it the abolitionists, say the evangelical campaigners for abolition, uh, who were instrumental to uh, uh, create, uh, passing the abolition of the slave trade bill in 1807 in Britain? Um, or is it uh, the legislators um, who actually wrote those laws, the politicians who uh, made it happen? Or is it, in fact, um, the enslaved themselves uh, who, by their running away, their rebellious activity, actually compelled, created the conditions in which those uh, um, evangelical campaigners and those legislators could act? And so I think all three of us um, kind of share share the frustration with that debate because it's often framed as a zero sum game by the public. For me, it, it leads to a general problem with the way we think about history, which is that I think it's fair to say that many people and perhaps most people tend to still think of history as a kind of parade, uh, a parade of heroes, right? Who either get the credit or don't get the credit for, uh, for causing things to happen. And I tend to think that it's more fruitful to think about history as a process uh, and as a predicament, right, uh, in that process. So when one thinks about history as a process uh, rather than as a parade, one then has to take what I call a more ecological approach, which is looking at <clears throat> how it is um, that various kind of um, conditions, inputs, if you will, various dynamic interactions help to create the conditions in which change happens, right? So we understand the process more in terms of fluid dynamics, right? Than in terms of just the individual agency of heroic figures or in terms of the structures, right? That often people think of as creating um, a, a societal, uh, societal uh, organizations. So in the book, Tacky's Revolt, that I've just completed about a year ago, um, I take a slave revolt that occurred over the course of about a year and a half, but I situate that within a century and a half of the story of slavery and warfare and rebellion that then culminates in the age of revolution. And what I try to do there is show how the actions of these enslaved people, their rebellious activity in Jamaica, in, in what was uh, the largest slave revolt in the 18th century British empire, 
actually was one of the crucial um, and dynamic and important inputs into a larger process of, of the end of slavery um, and the age of revolution. So it's not necessary to argue that the slaves are solely responsible for their own emancipation, only to argue that they're crucial to the larger process of emancipation as it plays out. And in fact, crucial to the inauguration of the age of revolution. So uh, very briefly, I'll just say that, you know, it is, it is in fact the case that some of the earliest um, uh, laws that were passed to restrict the slave trade were passed in response to these rebellions in the Caribbean, people because people feared uh, the importation of Africans as a security threat. So one sees, if one looks again in the Pennsylvania Gazette and the colonial newspapers in North America, one sees um, reports of the of Tacky's revolt, and in response to those reports of Tacky's revolt, new taxes being levied on enslaved Africans in Pennsylvania. Uh, they attempt it in Virginia. Uh, they do it also in New York um, in order to restrict the, the, the migration of these Africans to the colonies. And this helps to inaugurate a process, right, which what ends up culminating in the abolitionist campaigns of the 1780s uh, and on into the early 19th century. One also sees, uh, when one thinks about the age of revolution, that the reorganization of the British Empire following the Seven Years' War the reorganization of the empire that so incensed the North American colonists that it led to the rebellion of the 13 colonies in North America and ultimately the creation of the United States, that reorganization of the British empire was inspired in part by this revolt in Jamaica in 1760 and 61. And Jamaica was, as many people know, the largest, most militarily significant um, uh, and uh, most politically con well-connected colony in the British Empire. And I don't mean largest in terms of population, I mean largest in terms of financial and economic importance, the most profitable colony in the British Empire. So one sees how these revolts in the Caribbean had a shaping effect on the very nature of the changes that were going to convulse the Atlantic world, even if one can't draw a straight causal line from the revolt to abolition itself. So I hope we can talk about that more in general session, but I know that this is a question that that also uh, as exercises Professor Sinha as well, who's gonna be speaking next. So I'll stop there. You're muted, Miranda. Classic error. Um, but yes, um, yeah, thank you. And, and I think it's interesting what you're raising about how uh, slaveholders and enslavers are using the law for their own ends as well in this process and how that feeds in. Um, but we'll, we'll get back into all of this in a minute. Um, fine. Manisha, could you uh, say a few words to introduce yourself and uh, and have your some of your initial thoughts? Happy to. Thank you, Miranda. Um, I'm Manisha Sinha, uh, the Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut, uh, and the author most recently of The Slave Scores, A History of Abolition. So you can well imagine uh, that this topic of transatlantic abolitionism is something that I've really worked on and grappled uh, with for a long time. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from my home office in Massachusetts. Um, the the state of Massachusetts, where um, abolition came about because two enslaved people sued for their freedom. Uh, and I would like to build on some of the comments that John and, and Vincent have made. Um, the, the notion that enslaved people struggle for their freedom in various ways, um, that we need to have a capacious understanding of uh, slave resistance, it was not just always running away or even um, starting a rebellion or being part of a conspiracy. Uh, it could be engaging the law, uh, petitioning and suing for your freedom. Uh, and this tradition begins in uh, 17th century British North America um, with uh, enslaved men and women suing for their freedom uh, in Virginia. Uh, and it continues in Massachusetts. Uh, and this is where, of course, we get finally the Somerset case, where Charles Stewart, who was originally from Virginia, spent some time in Boston, uh, takes an enslaved man with him to, to England. And it becomes this iconic case that John mentioned, uh, the Somerset case um, that Granville Sharp, the abolitionist lawyer, um, took and that other abolitionist lawyers like Hargraves 
argued in British courts. Uh, and what I'd like to emphasize is that this comes at the end of a long tradition of enslaved people suing for their freedom uh, in the colonies. Uh, we know, of course, that English common law did not have a specific law of slavery, but many enslaved people had come into the British Isles, and certainly with the rise of colonial slavery, you have uh, uh, many colonists bringing enslaved people to Britain. Now, the Somerset case, as John mentioned, you know, it it, it did not, in fact, abolish slavery in Britain. Um, what it did do is make it more difficult for slaveholders, colonial slaveholders, to exercise their prerogatives uh, in England. Uh, and I think, um, you know, I know it's an iconic case that everyone talks about, but I think it is significant that the most important Anglo-American judicial decision uh, on slavery, especially as far as abolitionist law is concerned, bears the name of an enslaved man, James Somerset. Uh, and I think it is important for us, as Vincent pointed out, not to make this into a simple either or um, story. You know, is it is it uh, enslaved people are trying their best to win their freedoms in difficult circumstances uh, through the law, through physical resistance, whatever means are available for them? Uh, or is it, in fact, abolitionist lawyers, writers, thinkers who take up their cases and popularize them? It is, in fact, a mi mix of that. And it show gives us a window a little bit into how we should understand uh, the early modern West and abolitionist law. I'm not so much interested in, in African precedents in terms of culture or even the military roots um, as, as Vincent shows in his recent book, but I'm really interested in looking at how abolitionist law uh, in the early modern West, and this would include not just England, but also France and the colonies, the Americas, is shaped by uh, people of African descent as much as it is shaped by people of European descent. So we need to understand this broadly uh, as an interracial story uh, and one in which people brought different strengths uh, to move the process along um, towards emancipation. Now, why I think many of these laws are so important, uh, and of course, we know in England, there are many other cases that actually undercut Somerset. It's always a contestation. It's never as if it is established in law and therefore it exists. Enslaved people in the North, even after emancipation laws are passed, have to constantly contest for their freedom and their rights. And this continues uh, right down to the end of slavery in the United States. Um, after all, what is the Dred Scott case? except an enslaved man suing for his freedom. Um, so this contestation in law, making freedom claims is something that is extremely important to understand, I think, uh, abolition in the Anglo-American context. And what was known then as the Somerset principle or the freedom principle is something that abolitionist lawyers use in the United States in the Northern free states right up to the Civil War. Um, so it's not as if Somerset establishes something that is permanent, but it is it is something that abolitionists and African-Americans can hold on to and, and make a lot of uh, in terms of uh, restricting the rights of Southern slaveholders to sojourn in free states, uh, to free enslaved people who sue for their freedom, again, finding abolitionists, anti-slavery lawyers, Quakers, whoever they could find to represent them in the courts. So common English law protections, habeas corpus, trial by jury, due process of law become instruments of liberation when it comes to African-Americans claiming this. And eventually, of course, after emancipation, it becomes the basis for arguing for black citizenship in the American Republic. Uh, and that is why I think we should understand abolitionist law as always a hybrid process and one that involved, um, you know, actors uh, high and low. You're muted, Miranda. <laughs> I was listening so carefully. I, I didn't. I forgot. Um, I, I think. Are we all going to get on the screen now? I don't know. But I, I think. I think to sort of take a step back because we've done some wonderful deep dives into all your areas of expertise. But I think for the, it's, we've got quite a broad audience today, and so I was wondering if we could quickly run through a very brief narrative of 
abolition. I think I think it's important as well to make that distinction because we've jumped around a lot between the abolition of the trade in enslaved Africans and the abolition of enslavement itself. Um, who would like to jump in and give a potted history um, of abolition? Anyone? Go on then, John. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, from the British Isles perspective, 17... Uh, 72, there's Somerset's case that Manisha's just been talking about so eloquently. Whatever exactly it is, she's quite right, it's uncertain. And there, then there's the 1778 decision in Light's case, which is definitely the judges decide in favor of uh, complete freedom. Then, of course, there's the run up, there's 1807, there's the abolition of the slave trade in the British Empire. 1833, there's the act uh, with the transitional arrangements to in theory, freeing slaves from the Empire, but that, of course, doesn't apply to India because India is run by the East India Company. It goes through various stages. There's an act of, oh gosh, 1843, and it's not clearly abolished in British India until the Code of 1861. So it's kind of a pretty complicated story. And at the same time, the other European powers, France, basically gets rid of it in the early 1790s, then it reintroduces it. There is uh, the, the, the whole experience of what goes on in uh, what's now Haiti in Saint-Domingue. Then Denmark abolishes it in its colonies in the early 19th century, then France in 1848, and the Netherlands in 1863, I think. And then, of course, there's the, the amendment, the 13th Amendment in the United States. And I'm ashamed to say, I can't remember the date, 1864, 1865. I'm sorry. <laughs> Right. So from the US perspective, um, Manisha, you're obviously referring to certain states abolish things way before kind of nations do. So maybe you could give us a quick US based version of that. Absolutely. I'd be happy to. Um, and it is 1865. Um, <clears throat> the 13th Amendment, John, you got that yeah. right. Um, you know, if you look at emancipation, as Vincent put it, as not a singular event, mm -hmm. but as a process uh, that continued over decades, you know, you'd have to go right back to uh, the 18th century mm -hmm. uh, because that's when emancipation really starts. Now, you could argue, of course, that enslaved people are contesting their enslavement right from the start. Mm -hmm. um, but it is only with emancipation in the northern states of the United States after the American Revolution, which is a long and gradual process. You know, it sort of starts with the American Revolution and ends <clears throat> only in 1804. So all the Northern states abolish slavery. And then of course you have the Haitian Revolution, which I think is far more an abolitionist revolution than the American Revolution, because it leads to an immediate end um, to, of slavery. And of course, uh, it leads to the establishment of, of Haiti as an independent black nation. And we often forget and forget the Latin American revolutions, you know, that, that extended right up to the 1820s. Um, so this entire age of revolutions framework that we have, we when we think about it in the American context, it does have an emancipatory uh, legacy. Uh, many Latin American countries start gradually abolishing slavery. Again, it's a gradual process as in the North. Uh, and eventually you have many of the different colonies um, abolishing slavery. 1848, France again abolishes slavery after reinstating it in its other colonies. Um, you have the Dutch, you have the Prussian state uh, establishing a free soil principle. Uh, this notion of free soil, of a freedom principle that Somerset established in England has a counterpart in France and it, it actually involves an Indian slave from Pondicherry, which was a French protected, protected at that time. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very gradual process and it kind of unfolds throughout the 19th century, right up to the American Civil War. And of course, we must not forget British emancipation, uh, you know, um, the British Empire that abolishes slavery in 1833, but it's only uh, with the end of the apprenticeship system in 1838 that abolitionists truly view that as an, an abolitionist moment. Um, and then um, after the United States, you still have Brazil and Cuba and Puerto Rico, which then, so it's really not until the end of the 19th century. And similarly, you could talk about the African slave trade, even though Britain and the United States abolished the African slave trade uh, in 1807, and it takes effect in 1808, um, many of the other colonies and countries are continuing. 
uh, to import uh, enslaved people from Africa, despite Brit the best efforts of the British Navy. Um, and um, this process goes on through the 1850s. There's an illegal slave trade to the United States uh, in the 1850s. Um, uh, and there's an attempt in the South to actually uh, rescind the prohibition of the African slave trade. So these things are never written in stone. You know, we think of this in a very Whiggish way when we talk about Anglo-American history, you know, the continuous expansion of freedom, but they're constantly contested. There are many steps backwards. There's a vigorous trade going on to Cuba and Brazil uh, and African slave trade that abolitionists are trying their best to stem. Um, and it's really until the demise of all slave societies at the end of the 19th century that it is truly, you know, it comes to an end. So yes, it's it's a the history of abolition is is very long and it spans centuries and it's one of the reasons I uh, sort of ended up writing uh, a big history of abolition. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's all kind of excellent and and it's even more complex than we know, right? So one of the things that one immediately comes to when one studies the history of abolition is the problem of our geographical imagination. Like, where does it happen, right? And what counts as an abolition, right? Is it a state? Is it a territory? Um, is it an empire, right? So we often think of that abolition process as playing out within European colonial territories. But, you know, we know there are various abolitions of the slave trade in West Africa as well, right? Even before the European abolitions of the slave trade. So one thinks of Rudolf Ware's book on that 1776 overthrow of the hereditary slaving kings in the Senegal River Valley that also abolished the slave trade in Senegal. And we know that Thomas Clarkson saw that as a positive example as he was beginning to campaign for the abolition of the slave trade uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom. So um, we have to kind of reimagine, right, whose various abolitions feed into the general process. And I think that the, th the reason that's so important is in part because, you know, we know that some three quarters of all the people who migrated to the Americas down to about 1800, migrated from Africa, right? We know that the Americas were a largely African world, and yet we know very little of the African history that they brought with them and how that played out in the Americas and then how that reverberated around the Atlantic world, even back to European capitals uh, and European legislators. So how did how was it managed in the end? I mean, how, so it is a process, but I mean, how would how would you say that uh, abolition was achieved? And and yeah, let, how, do you, do you think that? I mean, obviously, there's there's that different distinction legally as well between kind of case law and precedents that are set. And uh, there's a there's a, a, a sort of pioneer of Black British history here called Peter Fryer, who referred to the legal pendulum, which is just what you were saying about, you know, one time that one judge will say this, and then another judge will say that. So there's a difference between that case law and then those sort of parliamentary statutes or, or kind of uh, legislature saying, you know, a much more kind of blanket um, statement. So, I mean, how, I mean, how useful was the law as a tool for abolition? That's a good question, Miranda, because um, you're right, you know, the pendulum of politics and law can swing anyway. And even though the British Empire and the British government tried to adopt the moral capital of abolition, they were not abolitionists. They even would use anti-slavery to colonize Africa, you know, as, as an excuse to colonize Africa. So it's really not at the realm of politics and law only that we can understand abolition. Uh, we really do need to look at the ways in which abolitionist activists, and that's why I found that my focus was on that radical interracial social movement composed of ordinary men and women. Uh, it, it becomes kind of a prototype of a radical social movement in the United States. Um, it, my focus was on them because I realized that even after the emancipation laws are passed in, in uh, the northern states, uh, slaveholders try to get around them. Yeah, They try to subvert them. They even try to recall them or rescind them. Uh, so it really requires activism not only to get those laws passed, but to make sure that they are implemented. and then try to make sure that the federal government steps up uh, and, 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 and tries to at least, um, you know, protect freedom in the North as much as it is protecting slavery in the South. Similarly in Britain, if you look at the British experience and the long sort of stage of apprenticeship, 
abolitionists don't stop agitating once the emancipation laws are passed because they're so unfair. They compensate slaveholders rather than enslaved people, and then they put them into conditions of semi-servitude. Uh, so it requires resistance at the grassroots by freed people themselves, but also by abolitionist activists to really get these implemented. Uh, and I think that's where maybe not only do we have to spatially increase the geographic scope of understanding the histories of emancipation in the modern world, but also look at the ways in which politics works at various levels uh, and the ways in which they are interconnected uh, and the ways in which grassroots struggles, even by enslaved and disfranchised people, uh, can have tremendous political significance in the realms of law and politics. If I can come in here, I think Manisha raises very interesting questions there. And um, because, for example, I have done, I did some work with some colleagues on uh, on the League of Nations definition of slavery in 1926. It's very clear that that definition also is a colonialist aspect. Which you think, who are the nations of the League of Nations in 1926? Basically, they're all colonial powers. And again, they wanted to use that often to attack uh, to, to, kind of for, to further colonial ends in Africa and else, else, elsewhere, because you can claim it's about civilization, getting rid of slavery and things like this. And, it's more, and also some of the colonial powers, such as France, were quite keen on compulsory labor and things like this. And so they had to come up with some kind of definition of slavery that is, is quite inter interesting to kind of uh, uh, present. So, so it's a kind of complex issue. But I think what Vincent, what Vincent said really struck me in his introduction at the beginning that, of course, it's a very complex process. It's not about, uh, when I was listening, it made me think of my, 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 my youth uh, that, and the punk rock group, The Stranglers, and their song, No More Heroes. And it is this problem. It's heroes, uh, or to go to Beach Boys, heroes and villains. You know, it's, it's this kind of odd, kind of almost uh, Thomas Carlyle view of great men and bad men kind of thing of history, which we need to really get beyond tempting, uh, though, 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 though it is. And it is a very complicated process, as we're all saying, I guess, of politics, history. But I also think of individuals. There's some individuals clearly who are terribly moved by these things, but also their campaigns. I mean, one of the things I'm quite interested in is newspapers. And when one, look, one looks at British newspapers, 18th century, you can see ones where they're very keen on what seem to us now very sickly saccharine stories of noble savages and things like this but they're also report they will report things like the 1775 um uh insurrection in jamaica you will discuss that they will discuss Poniatowski freeing the serfs. You know, they, there's a lot of discussion going about this, building up a kind of person, a, a view of, of slavery, of the need to deal with enslavement and its evils this time, even before we start to think of this crucial period that Misha talked about of the age of kind of revolutions. So, so I know we don't like heroes anymore, but do any of you actually have a secret hero that you've encountered in your work who you think really did make a difference or a group of people, perhaps? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, John mentioned Thomas Carlyle and his notion of, you know, the heroic individual. And I kind of, I kind of can't, can't stand Thomas Carlyle because he was such an anti-abolitionist and he wrote those awful uh, occasional discourses uh, that we are all aware of. If historians of slavery and abolition, we hold it against him. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, it may be the wrong question to ask about, you know, heroes. You know, heroes are mythic characters. Uh, as historians, we are uh, studying, you know, individuals who had, you know, uh, limitations and promises, even the most heroic of them, you know, slave rebels, they, they had their, you know, you look at Toussaint Louverture, I mean, heroic fight against France, but then, you know, all these draconian labor laws to restart the plantation economy. Um, as historians, I think, especially studying abolitionists, I've learned to appreciate heroic qualities in many of the black and white men and women that I have studied uh, and look at their limitations too, right? I, I think we, we, we need to go beyond the kind of morality play that uh, a lot of people <laughs> in fiction maybe come up, you know, the heroes and the villains uh, in history. What we can though talk about more broadly are, are systemic um, ways in which people have used the state of the law to, for oppressive 
needs and the ways in which people have imagined them in more emancipatory ways. And the United States is actually a, a good kind of case study for that. Uh, because even after emancipation and until today, the struggle for an interracial democracy in this country and for black citizenship is an ongoing one. Right. Uh, and in this process, we do have our heroes and heroines, the flawed ones, um, you know, and we have people who are the villains. But I think if we look at it more broadly uh, in terms of, you know, uh, which is the class of former planters and slaveholders and what is their interest in using the state in a certain way, you know, and in manufacturing myths about uh, the Civil War and its aftermath. Uh, you know, how are we going to understand those broad processes? I think that's a better question for me, at least, to understand both the process of enslavement, but also the long process of emancipation and the long afterlives of slavery, where the struggles have continued. Yeah, I agree largely with John and Manisha, but but maybe with this little bit of a dissent. You know, I grew up in the church, so I like parables and morality plays. Um, I actually find that they're they're quite useful, but not so much so that I can identify heroes and villains, but so that I can identify heroism, right? Because when one thinks of history as a predicament, right, in this larger process that we're all trying to explore and explain, um, that's fraught, that's vexed. That's something that that, that everybody understands and that, that one can valorize heroic behavior in those fraught and vexed circumstances is something that I still very much want to do as a writer. So I very much want to kind of hold up this interracial democracy that, that Manisha alluded to as an ideal and then valorize those actions, right, by people who took actions that would get us there when they did in difficult circumstances. And of course, they were flawed because I don't believe anyone can be infallible, but also everyone can be heroic. And even these fallible people who were mostly villains might have taken some heroic actions uh, that got us to where we want to go. So I still do tend to think of history uh, in somewhat moralistic terms, but I don't think that uh, any individual can completely embody villainy or heroism uh, on their own. Yeah, if I can come in here, I mean, I agree there with, with Vincent. It's uh, there. I, I, when you look at the records, I, I like kind of detailed study of particular periods. And there are people who do, I, th I agree, I can do heroic things. And it's, uh, I, of course, people are very mixed. People are all full of contradictions and so on, and, uh, and of contradictory moves and so on. And, and of course, those people who are politicians, politic politics is basically a dirty game. Any of us who are academics who've been involved in uh, as being an associate dean or dean, you know that there the politics is a dirty game, and you just learn that through, through working in a university, and, and it's pretty obvious. But I, I think one hero, so, 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 so that I'm sorry, uh, one person I think would be here, whom I find very interesting, a man called Joseph Knight, who had this, who brought the Scottish case, and who somehow persevered, and somehow. He must have had one suspects he had support in some way because he, he gets an amazing level of access through the Scottish legal system to end up with the result being given that you cannot be held as a slave in Scotland. And so if you arrive, say you arrive in Scotland, the court says you are free. You know, so so that, that is someone who had a, a kind of interesting life and you can actually get quite a lot about him, his wife, his children, things like this. And so, so I think you do find individual actors, but of course it's partly in the context, I mentioned all the newspapers are full of all this information. There's, there's, there's the kind of build up to this takeoff in the next decade of the abolitionist movement in Britain, where it becomes kind of a much a strong with the work, uh, well, uh, it becomes a kind of strong movement. Uh, with their, uh, so I'm going to stop there now because I'm running out of the train of my thought. Uh, Miranda, you're muted. I am so sorry. Let's think about, how, so I'm interested in, in I, I agree that there is a process in it. I, it's interesting to me as well, like how that does affect the lives of individuals and how individuals feed into the process. So, um, you know, and I, so how how do you think this whole kind of process towards abolition? How did that affect everyday people? How did it affect the enslaved people who were living through this predicament? So you know, this is why I try to write a history of the movement, of the abolition movement, uh, 
uh, because I think there was a lot of confusion about who exactly were the abolitionists. You know, we have these sort of individual, religiously minded, evangelical abolitionists, maybe an individual statesman. Uh, but instead, I thought that, uh, you know, abolition works well uh, in terms of understanding a radical social movement, um, that it included all these people, that it included the disfranchised themselves, and that it included the enslaved. Um, you know, there's been a lot of work done on how uh, slave rebellions and resistance fed into uh, British abolition. I mean, you can't understand the Abolition Act in, in Britain without understanding the Christmas Rebellion in Jamaica, right? Uh, you can't understand the rise of immediatism in this country without Nat Turner's rebellion. So we really need to understand abolition as a movement. And once you understand it as a movement, now that's where I find my heroism because this is a radical social movement. It creates this, this political space uh, for people who are you know, disfranchised in, in the America, who are not citizens, uh, including in Britain, you know, the way women get mobilized into the abolition movement. So I'm one who really wanted to make clear that it is not the British government. I'm talking about a social movement. I'm talking about those ladies' anti-slavery societies. Uh, you know, I am talking about, uh, um, you know, the petition campaigns. I'm talking about, um, you know, people like Clarkson, but also uh, people like Olada Equiano and a whole slew of Afro-British abolitionists who are part of this movement. So we, are, our notions of abolition, I thought, were very restricted. Uh, we, we thought about individuals. We didn't understand it as a movement, and therefore we didn't appreciate its political sophistication and the debates within abolitionist societies over different issues, whether it was, you know, immediatism, whether it was overlapping radicalisms that came from feminism, utopian socialism, pacifism. I mean, this was a really interesting radical milieu uh, that I love to uncover and in which people of African descent, men and women, were the heart of it. Uh, that, you know, if you understand this as a movement and if you look at those debates, you cannot possibly ignore some of them. It's much easier, of course, uh, in the United States where it was not simply a colonial issue uh, and where you did have a, a large group of African-Americans, an overwhelming number of them who were enslaved, but who fed directly into the abolition movement, you know, so that the fugitive slave abolitionists are the most outstanding ones. I mean, Frederick Douglass is only the most famous. Uh, there's a whole slew of these men and women who reshape and radicalize the movement. So that's the way I understand the heroism and I understand it more as a movement rather than there's an, interesting chapter, there's an interesting chapter in that story people like Frederick Douglass and Henry Box Brown and all these other well I think certainly people who heroically escaped enslavement you know for anyone who doesn't know Henry Box Brown actually posted himself to the north in a big box mm -hmm. uh, but then he goes on this sort of extensive speaking tour Reproducing, you know, jumping out of a box on stage every night. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently, recent research over here has mapped the uh, speaking tours of all these different abolitionists, uh, like like Frederick Douglass. Um, why? How do you think? What was the transatlantic relationship happening there? Why do you think uh, those uh, African American abolitionists coming on these speaking tours to Britain? How was that? How was that furthering the cause? Well, they were crucial to the cause and that, you know, I talk about the abolitionist international in my book and there was a black international uh, because they're shaming the American Republic. I mean, Douglas, again, is the most famous of them because he's there for two years. But there are others like William Wells Brown, James W.C. Pennington, Henry Box Brown, William and Ellen Craft, whose story is also remarkable. Right. Um, you know, she's so fair that she pretends to be his owner. And they actually go not in the Underground Railroad, but in the Above Ground Railroad all the way to Boston and then Canada and Britain. And their story is, is also rather remarkable. So these fugitive slave abolitionists are not just important in terms of national politics, uh, but also in terms of international diplomacy and law. They embarrass the American minister in London uh, by bearing testimony uh, to what's really happening in the slaveholding republic. And they create this uh, this sort of international opinion, uh, moral opinion against American slavery. 
Um, and they are seen as the best ambassadors of the abolition movement. They're the ones being sent. Um, you know, they're in Paris. They, they go to peace congresses. Uh, Paddington is awarded a, an honorary doctorate from the University of Heidelberg uh, in 1849. Uh, they published their fugitive slave narratives in London and elsewhere. So, so they really create this sort of international um, you know, before you have the Pan-African Congresses in the early 20th century, they're creating an international sort of public opinion uh, against slavery. And they're enormously successful in Britain. And what's really interesting is the places that they're most successful are in working class neighborhoods, you know, uh, Manchester, etc. They're the places where they turn out to hear these black abolitionists. It's, it's when, you know, like when Gandhi went to England, he was embraced by the textile workers in Manchester. So there is a sort of an, an attempt how successful it was in the end is, is something else. But there is an attempt to, to reach out internationally uh, and African-American abolitionists at least play an extremely important part in it. And before that, there were, you know, enslaved people from the West Indies, uh, some of the first slave narratives of men and women. Uh, and I'm also thinking of somebody like Wedderburn, you know, Robert Wedderburn, you know, and his uh, sort of transatlantic radicalism where he, adopts radical causes in England and you know marries them to to abolition. So these are very interesting figures and forgotten figures uh, that we really should know more about. So on, before we uh, go into the quest, we're going to have some questions uh, in a minute. But I've just we're, we've been quite um, American and British. Um, but Vincent, do you have a could you do you have anything to add on uh, you know, how how the legal struggle for abolition was affecting people in in the Caribbean? Yeah, I mean, two things. I would kind of look at it both ways, which is how, you know, the the actions of enslaved people in the Caribbean shape the legal transformations, right? And then how different laws created opportunities. And I think that that's one of the things that, that Manisha alluded to earlier, and John as well, that changing kind of um, uh, legal moves uh, in, the in the metropolis actually created new opportunities for enslaved resistance and struggles for freedom in one way or the other, right? So one wants to think of it both ways as a general process. Can you give an example of how sort of a legal judgment in London or, or, or Massachusetts sort of actually changed what was happening on the ground in, in, in Jamaica? Yeah, sure. So I'll go back, I'll go back to the example that I gave earlier from, from Tacky's Revolt, where you see in the wake of Tacky's Revolt, various legislatures, um, most pointedly in Virginia and Pennsylvania, passing new taxes against the importation of enslaved Africans, new laws trying to limit the importation of enslaved Africans. Now, that's part of a larger transatlantic colonial process. Was, Sorry? And that's specifically because newly arrived Africans were seen as being the ringleaders who were more rebellious and more likely to be. Right. Right. Because so, you know, there are various Africans from different parts of the continent, uh, in this case, Coromantes from the Gold Coast, roughly what's now Ghana, who were famous from the late 17th through the first three quarters of the 18th century for staging rebellions. Right. They were kind of identified as a particularly rebellious sort. Right. Um, now, in the wake of this largest slave rebellion in the Brit 18th century British Empire in 1760 and 61 and all the various reports circulating around it, um, legislatures in the North American colonies also decided, well, we need to limit the importation of people of these people and people like this, right? So they passed various taxes and, and import duties on Africans uh, in the transatlantic slave trade, not because they thought slavery was an evil, although they very well might have, but because they feared the migration, they feared the immigration of these Africans, right? So these were security measures as much as they were anti-slavery measures, right? So one, one, one sees early on that, um, that abolition as, is as much anti-immigrant and anti-African as it is anti-slavery, right? Now, that enters the kind of larger process of colonial process, where particularly in Virginia, they try to pass these duties in 1767, 1768, and again in 1772. And all three of them are disallowed, right, by the Board of Trade in London because slave trading merchants have more power in the British capital than these colonial legislators. And what you see, right, 
kind of in some of the antagonism toward the British that shows up in the mid 1770s is an antagonism against the British for what they say is imposing the slave trade on them. When one sees in those stricken drafts of the, of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson blaming the king for imposing the slave trade on them, one is also seeing, right, the fact that they had passed these import duties in order to limit the trade of Africans to Virginia in response to Tacky's revolt, and now the king and the influential merchants in London are disallowing them, right? That's part of the process of creating those antagonisms that led to the American Revolution. So that's how I see kind of thinking about these actions of Africans as shaping the legal context, right? Even if one doesn't think that they directly transform the law. Mm. And it's it's fascinating to hear you speak about that and show shows so much how enslavement isn't like a discrete topic. It's completely part of the warp and weft and actually part of you know changing these seismic differences like de seismic changes in in the period as well um and that has been and that has been a problem with the way we often study slavery and empire in general is thinking of slavery as a discrete topic so for example Taki's revolt turned out to have been one of the larger battles of the seven years war that titanic global conflict between britain and france and ultimately spain um and france's european allies right that you know, was in India, it was in the Philippines, it was in the Caribbean, it was in North America as the French and Indian War. And yet the largest, uh, most comprehensive studies of the Seven Years' War don't see Taki's revolt as part of the Seven Years' War at all, right? Because it's a slave revolt. This despite the fact that many of the soldiers, sailors, Marines um, who suppressed Tacky's revolt, had fought in other more famous battles of the Seven Years' War, as in Quebec or in Senegal or Martinique and Guadeloupe, and then they go to Jamaica to suppress Tacky's revolt. And yet, because it's a slave revolt, it's not seen as part of the same war, even though it's being fought by the same people, right? That is a problem with seeing slavery as a discrete topic in this larger uh, world history. Yeah, whereas it's really so global and international and, you know, someone can't cough over here without someone over there catching a cob. A bit of a COVID era reference simile there. I'm sorry. I, right. do tend to, I do tend to think that epidemiology might be the new model for historians going forward. <laughs> yeah, great. Yes, the the epidemic of freedom. Let's spread that. But um, so uh, so I'm just looking at a few of the questions that have coming in. Um, so uh, would we consider George Washington an abolitionist? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, George Washington was a slaveholder, of course, throughout his life, uh, which would uh, not make him an abolitionist. Uh, in my opinion, an abolitionist is a person who was an activist, who was actually involved in the abolition movement, not someone who was just anti-slavery and sentiment. You can go to all the American founding fathers and you can have a lot of them, especially the Virginia dynasty of slaveholders, spouting anti-slavery sentiment, including Thomas Jefferson, who put that indictment in the Declaration of Independence against the British monarch for waging war against an innocent people in Africa, right? Um, you know, they, they express a lot of anti-slavery sentiments, but they don't do much. Now, I am not one of those people who go from, oh, they were all abolitionists, oh, they were all just slaveholders. There's a lot of differentiation between them. Uh, and Washington did, in fact, free uh, the slaves that he had control over when he died, right? Uh, and he said that his wife's slaves would be freed after her death. And of course, she freed them immediately because she thought they would kill her in order to win their freedom. It shows you that she had a good sense of how they felt. Uh, the point remains that black, I, I discovered sermons by black abolitionists praising Washington for this last act and saying, let that be a model for others. So he is a complicated figure, um, you know, unlike Jefferson, Madison, including Patrick Henry, you know, the give me liberty guy who never freed his slaves. Uh, Washington was one of the few Southern founding fathers. A lot of the Northerners did, like Franklin, Hamilton, others, but one of the few Southern founding fathers who actually freed his slaves when he died in his will. Uh, and to me, more than that act, it was the way African Americans reacted to it and what they made of it and how they made that into an argument for abolition. 
So it is a complicated story, as everything is in history. It's interesting. I think when we give someone a title of abolitionist, we're almost also calling them a hero, aren't we? Like in our sort of view, view viewpoint. Um, although I was thinking that obviously a lot of people who argue for the abolition of the trade of enslaved Africans did not, you know, did not also agree that enslavement itself should be abolished, which is another kind of distinction to bear in mind. Um, sort of along the like same sort of lines in a way, I suppose. Um, got a question was the eman was eman was the emancipation proclamation a heroic stand on principle that's heroic in inverted commas a heroic stand on principle or a wartime expedient you know i i i'm sorry that you know the american imperialism wins what can i say it, it tends to hog all the attention but you know uh, uh eman the emancipation proclamation is often seen as a military necessity people said it had all the glory of a bill of lading well, one historian called it because of its legal language but lincoln was careful when he issued it because he wanted to make sure that it would not be constitutionally challenged that he was using his war powers as precedent as abolitionists had begged him to do right from the start of the war in order to get rid of slavery. But, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation is an extremely significant document. It is a heroic document. As Lincoln said, it was a central act of his administration. As Frederick Douglass said, it was the greatest act of the 19th century. It marks a turning point in the war, uh, and it does make emancipation the goal of the American Republic, of the Union. Uh, and the armies are then marching in order to implement it. So I'm not one of those who scoffs at the Emancipation Proclamation only because it freed slaves in those states that were still under rebellion and then made exceptions for those areas that were controlled by the Union or for slave states, the four of them, that didn't secede and were still part of the Union. The point remains that once you had that proclamation uh, you, and once Lincoln was reelected, the point was that if you abolish slavery in Mississippi, it was not going to last in Missouri for too long, right? Uh, so it is a turning point in the war, and it is an extremely significant act. So in my eyes, yes, very heroic. And the ways in which Black people celebrated it, the ways in which abolitionists celebrated it, uh, shows us that they understood its significance. Um, so uh, another question we have is, how much did the development of Anglo-American law on property and contracts through the 17th and 19th centuries rest on or was driven by protecting the system of enslavement? I'd say it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, if, if I'll maybe say as, as the lawyer here, I'll just say it's a it's a, this is an almost impossible question uh, because uh, as soon if you accept that you can have enslavement of in in human beings, the rest of the law basically just falls into place. You can use contract lease. You don't really need need for for that kind of thing. So for as regards property and contracts, you make that decision. You can have an enslaved, people can be enslaved and become treated as property, then you don't actually need to develop much else. What you do need is what you find in most uh, in, in, in colonies and what you find in ancient Rome is you have a, a very elaborate kind of, I suppose, police regulation of slavery because it raises problems not of property and contract because they're there you just use those systems for fun. you you mentioned uh, someone mentioned bill of lading in as regards to proclamation the language of bill of lading well i've i've seen a bill of lading uh, in scotland which uh, transports uh, an enslaved woman as, as cargo with cargo from london to to dunbar so so you, it's all there you just need to make that leap but the the uh, but it countries where they have to face all kinds of strange problems. Uh, that's one of the strange things if you're a lawyer, look at it. How, what, what if someone who is judged to be a slave under your legal system commits a crime? You prosecute them. You decide they should be hanged. Well, that deprives the owner of property. Well, how do you deal with that? Or your slave commits a tort, as you would say in the North America. And how can you sue a slave? Is the master then liable? You know, there are all these kind of weird, weird problems that are, 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 arise, which are dealt with in 
in the Caribbean colonies and in the North American colonies by elaborate codes which regulate this type of, uh, of stuff. So I think the focus on property and contracts rest on or driven by protecting the slave. And that's actually not a, not a question which which addresses as something significant because as soon as you've got to enslave, so as soon as you have accept, you can have enslave individuals, then property and contracts falls into place. But it, it is interesting, isn't it, when 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 the fallacy of that concept comes out, you know, like I suppose famously here in the, the Zong case in 1783, where um, uh, enslaved in, in people are being treated as as property in an insurance case, having been throw, thrown overboard uh, by the enslavers. Uh, and, and, you know, and Granville Sharp and the other abolitionists are saying, well, this should be a murder case. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think I think it's that, that, that's interesting when when law when law isn't doing enough, um, and that continues the the process. Um, right, I think we're right, running just, out. Of time. Just, to add, just to add to that, and one of the most interesting things about that case is the ten who voluntarily jumped overboard and committed suicide during that massacre immediately voided their value in law. <laughs> the court wow. decided. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I would add generally to that also uh, that, you know, the commodification of human beings, right? Human property creates real problems. And so property laws are a real impediment to emancipation throughout the Anglo-American world and throughout the Western world. Uh, once you recognize human beings as property, then all these other qu strange and bizarre questions come up about compensating slaveholders rather than enslaved people for year, you know, hundreds of years of stolen labor. So I think property laws, in, at least in the American context, act as a real impediment uh, to emancipation and also contract. When I mean, you think of John Locke and he thinks of slavery as legitimate in, in a war, right? Prisoners of war, but it's outside the social contract. It's a state of war, right? It's a state of war and therefore, you know, these people have no rights. And whatever rights you give them is, you know, privileges. Um, so I think both contract and property laws, in general, act as real impediments to uh, emancipation in the United States. And on emancipation, when it comes to discussing uh, breaking up the plantations and redistributing that land uh, to formerly enslaved people, which was a demand put up by many abolitionists and radical Republicans. One of the reasons that fails is because of this, uh, this, this, this idea that property is sacred. Uh, and already emancipation was the uncompensated uh, emancipation. Uh, I mean, it's the largest uh, instance of, of uncompensated uh, property confiscation in the United States, the emancipation of 4 million people valued at $3 billion in the 1860s. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I can come in there, yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. But, but I think the point is that as soon as you accept the idea that a human being can be held as property, then the law exists already. And then, of course, there's the problem that, that you've made. And this is why, of course, in Britain in 1833, France in 1848, and the Netherlands in 1863, and I, I dare say other European colonial powers that had colonies of slaves, why they all gave compensation to the slave owners. I mean, it's, it's because because it's on the principle of you know what Anglo-American law is called eminent domain. The state is depriving you of your property, and therefore you should get something in return. And of course, it seems pretty abhorrent. Uh, of course, uh, but but that that I guess is is, is what's going on. Yeah. And it was such a big bill that the British taxpayer only stopped paying off the loan that the government needed to pay the compensation here in 2015. So many of our viewers may have helped pay that bill. Um, we're, we're out of time, but there's one more question, which I think we could quickly do, which is, the question is, what are the top books to read, read law and slavery? But if each of you just say one book you think people should read, apart from your own, of course, uh, then uh, yeah, so one book each, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Anyone, Manisha, which, which one book would you recommend to our audience? Um, so there are, of course, numerous books on uh, American slave law. You know, the great Ian A. Leon Higginbotham, Thomas Morris's book on slavery and the law. But the one that I will recommend uh, is a new book by a legal scholar, Christopher Tomlins.
uh, that actually looks at Nat Turner's rebellion, uh, but has wonderful meditations on slave law, uh, on um, on the philosophy of enslavement and, and the ways in which uh, law, religion, and um, enslavement interact um, to create both the circumstances of enslavement, but also of rebellion. Um, I would recommend. Um, I think it's called In the Matter of Nat Turner. In the Matter of Nat Turner. Matter of Nat Turner. Like and it's, uh, that, that would be on that would be on my list too. And so yeah. we can make this a Christopher Tomlin's Love Fest. And I would recommend his Freedom Bound, which was a previous <laughs> book, which I think which I think is excellent. And, and John? Hmm. <clears throat> I think I will go with the same because I've actually run out of ideas and nothing <laughs> come to my mind, actually, I have to confess. Okay. I shall I shall <laughs> concur. Okay then. Um, great. Well, that's that's the book. The book we should, everyone should go out and get. I guess. Um, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think if I can come up with something radical. And um, um, yeah. No, mind drawn. Brand blank. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, if we want, so if we want one radical book, we could go with uh, Nikhil Paul Singh's "Race and America's Long War," which is not specifically about law, but it is very much about the conditions in which law is made. Um, probably focused a little bit more narrowly on the United States than, than this conversation, but a very illuminating and, and very, very stimulating text. So that's Nikhil Singh, Race in America's Long War. Yeah, there's a there's an older book um, by Adam Hofschild called Bury the Chains, and it oh, yeah. was rather brought out, you know, around the 2007 bicentennial moment, and it is quite that traditional heroic story of. I think Clarkson is more the his, the hero of that book than Wilberforce, but yeah. it does at least it tells you the classic narrative you can then challenge by reading all these other things, um, and it is it is pacey, and I think it does bring across that element of. Uh, abolition as a social movement. I mean, he very much makes that case that you know it's the first time really that uh, you know that yeah that ordinary people have campaigned and that's had an impact on on the legislature in such a grand way. Anyway, uh, we've gone over our time a little. Thank you so much. There's so much more to say and to cover. Um, I hope we've whetted people's appetites that they will go off and do some reading and listen to some of the other debate uh, discussions this week as well. Um, so, so thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks. Fantastic. Good to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. so much.